Hello, everybody. We have got uh, some things under our control now that we did not have in previous parts of this series. So when you saw those predictions about the snow and you thought, oh yeah, fracking said <laughs> snow, that always happens. Well, we can't really talk about the powers that we have developed, but you'll notice what happened. Snow? No, it didn't happen. So, um, actually, we did not even pray, and then there it just, it just turned out to be an evening with traction, which we were really grateful for. Um, welcome to Fracking Sense. This is the first time we have had back-to-back -back Fracking Sense talks with Tim Worth and Jim Martin joining us last night, and this has been so stimulating for all of us at the center that we are planning to devote the entire month of April to a Fracking Sense festival with a lecture every night that month. <laughs> A few people were actually looking scared at that. <laughs> and here's the punchline to that remark, beginning on April Fool's Day. <laughs> Are you going to ask for the disclosure on that? I don't know if I can provide that. Um, and yes, that was an April Fool's Day joke three weeks ahead of time. But we do have a Fracking Sense talk a week from tonight in this room at the regular time with Rebecca Watson who is a former assistant director of the interior and an uh, attorney very involved in energy issues. And then we have spring break, during, which, well, that makes all of us at the Center of America most very sad because we are deeply committed workaholics and the idea of a vacation frightens us and unnerves us. But then we come back and we have an April Fool's Day talk. Uh, we have on April 1st, we have well, no one will be here in, well, actually, I'm kind of a fool's garb today, if you look at it. Um, but instead of a fool's celebration, we will go the opposite direction. We'll have one of the world's experts on the actual process of hydraulic fracturing, what actually happens in the shale with the uh, fluid injected, Norman Werpinski. Well, tonight we are very fortunate, or I should always say, before I say how fortunate we are tonight, that this event is made possible by a grant from the National Science Foundation Sustainability Research Network for a project on hydraulic fracturing and natural gas development. And here I must ritually note that the National Science Foundation does not endorse and is not burdened with responsibility for anything said in this series or by me. We're grateful to our co-sponsor for the Fracking Sense series, the Boulder County Government. As usual, we will stick to our program of having you write your questions on the little sheets in the program uh, because it does have this intoxicating quality that I can cover every question, that every question gets presented to the speaker, which has never happened in any other forum I've uh, attended. Folks from the Center of the American West will be walking around, as they usually do, after 15 or 20 minutes into the talk, collecting your questions and also distributing more little sheets of paper if you need them. I should say another great value of this for us is that we keep those records so we know what the public is asking and, and thinking about. So now, Punchline. We are fortunate to have Pete Morton as our speaker tonight. Pete received his PhD in natural resource economics from Colorado State University, which is its own important reminder of how much we in Boulder benefit from having CSU as our neighbor and educational comrade. For many years, Pete was the director of economic research at the Wilderness Society. He has published widely and he has testified in a, on important matters before Congress and in federal court. Pete deepens his understanding of natural resource economics by field work conducted by observing patterns and trends in recreation from a mobile positioning observational station which consists of two skis, depending on the season, sometimes two hiking boots. Right? It's all done for the deeper understanding of humanity. That's what he's doing that for. It is my understanding that his PowerPoint tonight contains one graph that is breathtaking in its originality and fresh insight, and which we will never forget. I haven't seen this, but desperate to see it. And even better, this memorable graph will be embedded in some very helpful and insightful recommendations on this topic tonight, redefining res responsible oil and gas development. Pete Morton. Okay. So I think you've got time to read this, so uh, the idea is that we're at a point where we've had a lot of issues come up with natural gas and oil, and as we move from drilling in the middle of nowhere to drilling in suburbs, we sort of have to do things differently. 
And so my co-author is Joe Kirkley. He's a professor at Oregon State. And this is our attempt at sort of coming up with a system that makes sense to us. And a lot of what we're doing here is sort of, you know, my background's in forestry. And we're taking sort of some of the principles of managing non-renewable uh, renewable resources and applying them to non-renewable resources. So none of this is really that new. Uh, it's new to oil and gas. It's not new to forestry. So uh, I have a lot to cover. I've been working on oil and gas for 13 years. So I'm going to start, I'll do a quick review of some of the research we did. Uh, I'm going to talk about the land ethic and then just a quick preview of uh, phased energy development. Uh, I'll talk about an energy consumption ethic and the hypocrisy curves, which Patty is so excited about. Mm -hmm. I'll look at our uh, supply of natural gas and the, and the drilling boom and uh, what I think is brand damage going on to the oil and gas industry. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about economics, uh, externalities, um, fugitive emissions, and then wildlife impacts. Patty wanted me to cover that. That's some research we did 10 years ago, so uh, I'll cover that. And then get back into economics on uh, community development and natural amenity development. And then we'll finally get down to here. I'm just sort of setting the, up this conversation for uh, redefining what we think would be more responsible development than what has occurred uh, in the past. <laughs> so uh, <clears throat> during a, this is during the uh, Bush administration, and I think this sort of represents some of the best research that's ever come out of environmental groups. Uh, we were had the luxury of a uh, little bit of funding and no oversight, <clears throat> and uh, we put out some really good work. Uh, the first report kind of looked at jobs in the Arctic versus renewable energy, and jobs has always been an issue. And so just we have options of how we spend our money, and so <clears throat> depending on how you want to spend it, you can create more jobs. Uh, in 2001, the big issue was the National Forest Roadless Rule. If we could just get rid of the National Forest Roadless Rule, natural gas prices would drop. It was the big problem. So we did an analysis of how much oil and gas was in roadless areas and BLM monuments and determined that it wasn't as much as uh, it wouldn't have made a much different on price. Uh, then, then I'm going to get into this later, but we did, uh, as far as I can tell, the first analysis of fragmentation of wildlife habitat in an oil and gas field. And then we did a conference paper in 2004, which actually uh, Rebecca Watson and I were the two debaters, and we were debating the Bush Energy Plan at a national conference, so you'll hear her points uh, next week. And then we did uh, some jazz assessment of the Rome Plateau. And then this is really cool. We did a nice computer simulation uh, flyover of the Rome Plateau using uh, this really good technology, looking at what it would look like, the visual impacts of drilling on top of the Rome Plateau different, at different well densities. Uh, then then uh, we developed some methods for estimating habitat fragmentation from proposed drilling. And a law review article and then uh, some phase development stuff. So it was a very exciting time, uh, a lot of pressure, uh, but uh, we did a lot of good research, I think. So I'm going to start, I usually end with the land ethic, but I'm going to start there because it sort of grounds me. It's sort of where I'm coming from. It's sort of my point of view. Uh, it's from Aldo Leopold, 1949, but it, it broadens the picture on what we're supposed to care about. And I like it because it, 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 it broadens the sense of community from just people and jobs to other species. And I think there's some responsibilities we have as the superior species to look after others. And so this is sort of where I start off things, is sort of with the land ethic and making sure that we take care of the land. We have to drill for oil and gas right now because our economy is dependent on it. But taking care of the land, I think, is a common theme that I think everyone can appreciate. So just to jump in where we think we need to go is uh, what we wrote a paper a few years ago on phased energy development. And <coughs> the idea is regulating the pace and scale at which development occurs. And we think that drilling at a fast pace and over a large scale is sort of the antithesis of the land ethic. It's not taking the time to do things right. And you get into these booms and everyone's in a hurry and I understand why from a profit maximization standpoint, but uh, it comes down to whether it's consistent with, with uh, good management. 
And we focus on pace and scale because they're key variables for determining not only jobs and local communities, but the externalized damages to the environment. The faster you go, the more likely you're going to make a mistake. And we question, I think, some of the assumptions in past interpretations of responsible oil and gas development that faster and bigger is always better. And I think you've had some views in judicial decisions and political decisions and economic decisions that anything that slows down oil and gas development, anything that slows down the pace or the scale is a bad thing. And I, I'm, I'm not sure that's always the case. And so we, Joe and I, support the right of local communities to be able to regulate inside their city limits how much oil and gas goes on, just like other, other activities. And this is not a new concept, okay? This is Gifford Pinchot, uh, father of the Forest Service, and uh, regulating the pace of scale has been going on in forestry for over 100 years. <coughs> and, and we used to study this in forestry school. It's the regulated forest. So let's say you have a 200-acre forest and you have a 50-year rotation. You would cut four acres a year for 50 years, and you would get into this continual harvest. And it wasn't about going in and clear-cutting the whole watershed. There was some restraint and some humility amongst foresters to say, no, that's not right. Even though we have best management practices that we've had for 40 years and other environmental regulations we have, the pace and scale of which you do your logging determines the total environmental impact. And so you regulate the pace and scale at which you log in order to not only provide a more sustainable harvest, but to sort of internalize some of the cost. And this came about because of the clear cutting in the Southern Appalachian National Forest early in the 1900s, when you had huge siltation into the waterways and, and ships couldn't get through. And so one of the original justifications for the National Forest and the Organic Act is watershed protection, uh, sort of an ecosystem service. First time, you, it's only one of the few acts that actually recognizes an ecosystem service as one of its primary goals. So controlling the pace and scale for the greatest good, for the greatest number, for the longest time. Now this quote is actually from an economist, but we'll give it to Pinchot. This is Jer Jeremy Bentham said it back in like England in the 1700s. But this is, this is the idea. We're thinking the greatest good for the greatest number for a long time. So we're expanding the time frame we're expanding the number of people involved. And so what we're recommending in terms of phase development is just something that foresters have been doing for a, day, uh, for a century. And uh, this talk from 2012 from Walter Echo Hawk really resonated with me because it reminded me that the land ethic did not start with a couple of white dudes. It started long ago. And, and he reminded us that this land used to belong to them and how we need to take care of it. And so this really hit me because he called for a new American land ethic that recognized beyond the colonial understanding, manifest destiny, to value indigenous habitat, holy places, and cultural resources. So it sort of broadens us to look beyond just the material resources, whether it's timber or oil or gas or coal or grazing, to broaden what we're concerned about. <coughs> and my good late friend Randy Udall uh, talked about the oil tribe as us being the oil tribe and how we've gone through time and we may just be this little blip that's you know rapidly consuming the oil. And he talks about the local gas station being our secular temple. And hungry for speed, addicted to motion. We consume our weight in petroleum every seven days. And Randy was an inspiration to me. And this is a picture from the, the Wind River Range, which is my favorite range in the lower 48. Done a lot of backpacking there, and that's where Randy died. And Randy was really big on an energy ethic sort of a consumption ethic, recognizing that we have this 
pot of gold with us, this oil and gas that can do amazing things. And maybe we want to think about how we use that. So this uh, evolved into an energy consumption method. So one of the ideas is to simply voluntarily think about our energy consumption and think about a consumption ethic. Very flows directly out of an American land ethic. I'm working on the uh, City of Boulder Natural Gas Working Group, and we're struggling with this issue. What we have is sort of, on one side we have progressives pushing renewable energy and a local municipality. And on the other side, we have fractivists concerned about natural gas. And so hypocrisy has come up in this discussion. And what happens when two progressive movements collide? Do we make progress? That's what we're struggling with, with the natural gas group. But this is the two things that kind of came out of our meetings, was to address our hypocrisy. Can we reduce our consumption of fossil fuels as rapidly as possible, understanding climate change concerns? And can we green up the supply chain of what we're using? So to address our hypocrisy, reduce our demand, and then try to green up what we are using. And we've talked about a certification part process. So Boulder, working with other communities, maybe enlisting other companies that want to do something about uh, climate change or do something about energy independence or whatever number of things to sort of green it up. Like, yeah, I want to buy, you know, this worked very well in forestry. Hmm. Spotted owl debate came out. We were cutting a lot of old growth forest and we started the forest certi certification program. And that meant that we wanted to do things more sustainably. And the big shift in that debate was when Home Depot signed on and said, we want to sell green lumber. And this is simply consumers expressing their preference in the marketplace. That's how economics works. A lot of people think that markets lead consumers by the nose, but in theory, consumers are supposed to express their preference in the marketplace. So if you get consumers, communities, businesses expressing that, yeah, we use oil and natural gas, but can we get it a little cleaner, all of a sudden you might have some movement there. So these are the two things that we're working on in the natural gas working group here in Boulder. And uh, so I'm trying to channel a little of Randy. He was very irreverent. And so I threw this up there. And, and this one, you know, we think car sharing is a new thing. And this is from 1943. And this is some of the sacrifices that the greatest generation made. We're at war, and maybe we have to make some sacrifices. And then, we've been at war now for a long time recently, and we're not asked to make very many sacrifices. Consume, keep going, keep going, keep spending, keep spending. That's what the greatest generation did. This is kind of us in our current generation. And I'm, I'm there, I love a road trip, don't get me wrong. I can't get away without them. But doing the same thing and expecting different results is, is sort of crazy. And this is where I see oil and gas industry and fractivists. If we keep doing the same thing, we're going to go insane. So we got to do both have to do things differently. And uh, when I worked in a national environmental group, I was sort of on the left side. I was sort of the left fringe of the national environmental group. and was often referred to as an environmental radical and uh, an extremist. And then I work in Boulder and I'm a moderate. <laughs> so I find myself in the middle. The other gas industry doesn't like what I say and a lot of the fractivists don't like what I say so I'm kind of like, alright, this might work. But what's interesting is this quote was in the Narcotics Anonymous handbook from the 70s. So how do we treat our addiction we have to do something different. So this is my, uh, I came up with this last week. This is my uh, NIMBY hypocrisy curve. This is its debut. 
So we have hypocrisy over here on the y-axis <laughs> and consumption of fossil fuels on the x-axis. So if you've got a 20,000 square foot home, heat it to 80 degrees in the winter and 60 degrees in the summer and drive three Hummers and complain about an oil and gas well, you're kind of a big hypocrite. <laughs> All right? But you can slide down the curve of hypocrisy by embracing a consumption ethic. Businesses and individuals can reduce not only their addiction, but their hypocrisy. So if you move from this level of consumption down to this level of consumption, you have a pretty good drop in your hypocrisy. So sliding down the curve of hypocrisy is what we're trying to do in Boulder in the Natural Gas Working Group. And I think it's something that everyone should look at their own lifestyles. We all have things, and I'm not talking about going to coal showers. It's very easy rounding errors that we can make in our lifestyle before we have any suffering. You know, putting a power strip on your TV to turn off the, the gray energy that runs there all the time doesn't affect me at all. Turn it off when I go on vacation doesn't affect my lifestyle at all. So this is the curve of hypocrisy decreasing your consumption. So what other advantages besides reducing your hypocrisy would that be? So uh, in 2013, the Potential Gas Committee out of the School of Mines, a bunch of good, very good geologists, estimated our potential gas and came up with about 2,700 trillion cubic feet. So, but this is technically recoverable. And I've talked to them and they're like, yeah, we're not economists. It's like, yeah, that's fine. So this is what's technically possible. So if you assume an economic recovery rate of 100%, we have about 105 years of natural gas. This was one of the, this report was one of the biggest increases, like a 20% increase from previous reports of what our supply was. But what happened was that the 100 years didn't go up because our demand also increased a pretty good chunk in that few years. So now, the advantage of embracing a consumption ethic is if we decrease our consumption one or two percent a year down to half the current rate. So I, I ran the graph down to half and then capped it. All of a sudden, we're stretching our supplies 165 or 186 years just by decreasing our consumption. On the other hand, if we increase our consumption 2% by exporting natural gas <coughs> or by going for compressed natural gas vehicles or just by converting more power plants, a 2% increase, which is actually less than we average, we're down to 53 years. This is just math. This is L. Bartlett math. This is nothing rocket science here. If we increase it 5%, we're down to 35 years. So we got to be careful about incentives to increase our demand because it really drops down our energy security dramatically in a short amount of time. So one advantage of embracing the consumption ethic is energy security for a much longer time. And, you know, oil can be used for an amazing number of products. And burning it in our vehicles is probably the really low, low end. It'd be nice to save some of this really valuable resource for future generations. So I asked this question in uh, six years ago. So John Rawls is an old philosopher, Theory of Justice in 1971. And he had this concept of the veil of ignorance. It's sort of like, if you don't know where you're going to be in society, would you favor something that's for poor people or rich people? You don't know your place. So you're, you're ignorant of your place in society. So I took that and said, all right, if you don't know whether you're going to be alive now or in the year 2525, what would you do? What would you prefer? Would you prefer the current generation to consume the oil and gas as rapidly as possible? Or would you prefer them to reduce their consumption so something might be available for you? 
You don't know what generation. There's no right answer. It's just whether you're risk adverse or risk taker. But it provides a sort of a framework. And if you think about what some of the greats in the past have done, and you think back to that poster about riding alone with Hitler, and some of the sacrifices the greatest generation made, and to make our life now amazing, are we making any sacrifices now, sort of for 200 years from now? So I don't have an answer. Everyone has their own answer. Uh, it doesn't make any difference. It just broadens the frame from which to think about some of these things. So second graph on the hypocrisy curve. So the other thing we've talked about is, in addition to reducing our consumption to slide down the curve of hypocrisy, you can shift the curve of hypocrisy. And this would be sort of a third party certification process. <coughs> so in this case, if you consume C1, but all of a sudden a, you've captured your methane, you're capping your wells, you're doing all of this stuff to green up the supply chain, you've dropped your hypocrisy. So the two things that we're trying to do uh, in, the bull, in the working group is to shift the supply curve, to make it greener, to make it uh, you know, a little bit more uh, to our liking, and it's a market-based mechanism. So you have a third-party certification that goes around. You don't have to worry about the state having funding for inspectors. You don't have to worry about that. You have a third-party certification process, and if you want to buy green gas, it goes into the system. Uh, one of the challenges, of course, is that if you think your gas is greener, well, I'm going to consume more. And this is, I think it's called Javen's Paradox, which is when you get more miles per gallon in your car, you drive more miles. So it could easily be that this goes out that way. How do you spell that J? How do you spell that? Uh, J E V O N, I believe. So the two things we're trying to do to reduce our consumption and to shift the supply curve to a little bit more greener. So now let's review, uh, let's jump, jump ship. <coughs> This is uh, the natural gas drilling boom and oil and gas drilling boom that we've just gone through. Are we great? We're in the middle of it. I only went to 2010. I didn't update this graph. But it gives you an idea of, you know, when we think about going to the war in the Middle East, it's not about oil in the Middle East. It's about drilling at home. So every time we go to war, we've got a big spike in, in uh, oil drilled. Uh, you'll see, interestingly, so this is uh, natural gas and this is oil. So the boom started off as a natural gas boom and then became an oil boom. What's interesting is that uh, we've drilled more wells than any other country in the world. And so when we talk about no one has access, no one has access, well, there's been a lot of access granted in the past. And we've drilled an awful lot of wells. And we're running into the more difficult to develop resource. But this also illustrates the boom and bust nature of oil and gas drilling. So this is where we've been drilling. This is a, a map of the shale plays and the major type gas plays. And if you start looking at some of these areas, there's a lot of people living there. And there are a lot of towns, a lot of private property, and a lot of concern. And I don't think fractivists are going away. This is an amazing social movement. I have not seen, I think the old growth, old growth movement, uh, saving the old growth forest was a pretty significant movement, but it was really a, a Northwest movement, trans, you know, cross country. But this is a national movement that is growing leaps and bounds every day. So I don't think it's going away. And I think it's probably gonna grow as more and more people start having a drill rig in their backyard or near the watershed, there's more and more concern. I think I just read an article where the California state Democrats are voting to ban fracking in the state of California. So you got to figure this stuff out. So as we move into these more populated areas to get these unconventional resources, we're going to have to do things a little differently or we're going to drive each other crazy. And so I think we've got a little brand damage going on. 
We went from clean burning natural gas, being the environmentally friendly, to frack gas. And it's a huge branding problem for the natural gas industry. Uh, we have supply estimates that are based on technically recoverable estimates that may not be recoverable at current prices. I think arrogantly dismissing environmental and community concerns threatens industries, social license to operate. This is a phrase that Bill Ritter uses. But you have to be, watch out for that. And then my background's in business and accounting before I went into forestry. <laughs> Telling your customers they're extremists and radicals is a really bad marketing plan. <laughs> These are people that use your product. And they want to keep using your product. And if you keep calling them crazy, they don't want to use your product anymore. And then we got some questionable job claims, which I'll get into. So this is a graph from USGS. And when you're looking at undiscovered resources, there's a lot of things to consider. You've got probabilities of being discovered, and then different volume estimates, and then different curves that you can use. You could uh, rely on just sort of the gas that's in place. Or you could rely on what's technically recoverable. Or you could apply an economic screen and look at what's economically recoverable. Well, I'm an economist, and this is the only curve that matters to me in terms of supply. Supply is an economic term. It's not a technical term. If you can't get it out of the ground at the current prices, it's, there's no supply. <clears throat> so depending on which curve you use, depends on, on how much you estimate might be in a roadless area or might be available under the town of Longmont. And you can also use different probabilities to estimate that. You could say a 95% probability, which is very sure, <coughs> and it's a much smaller amount. Or you could say a 5% probability, which is wrong 19 out of 20 times, but <coughs> has a much larger amount. And Or you could do the mean estimate. So depending on which curve you use and which probability you use, you can come up with a lot of different numbers. Uh, when President Bush was in office, I worked on a report on the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, and he cited 16 billion barrels of oil in order for to drive drilling in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. That was a 5% probability. That was his choice, but that 5% probability was not well broadcast. And if a climate scientist would run climate scenarios that had a 5% probability they would not be taken very seriously. So if we're going to base our natural gas supply estimates on what's technically possible, we should do the same thing for renewable energy. We're talking symmetry in analysis. And right now, it's technically possible to get a majority, if not all, of our energy from renewables. It might be very expensive, it might be unreliable, but it's technically possible. So we need to have a little bit more transparency in our supply estimates and symmetry in the methods. Because I've seen the oil and gas industry complain about the high cost of renewables and then cite their technically recoverable estimates, which have no cost analysis. And one of the reasons why, here's a historical lesson from oil shale. And this is from a 1980 report from the Office of Technology Assessment. And this is the cost estimates for an oil shale processing plant in Colorado. Original estimates, 1968, were under $200 million. Twelve years later, you're up over $1.6 trillion. When people want to get projects started, you always lowball. You always go low, and then you have cost overruns. But this is just an example why you don't want to start off and invest a lot of money in oil shale based on this. You might want to wait to get this. So economics is important in terms of determining supply. It's technically possible to get oil shale out of the ground. It's very expensive. So what we're doing now is we're sort of drilling down the resource triangle. And as we move down from conventional reserves down to unconventional, we have increasing pricing and increasing technology. 
And as industry will tell you, fracking is not new. It's been used for 40, 50 years. What they combine is horizontal drilling and fracking. They combine two old technologies. So I'm thinking we're into sort of beta one of fracking technology, combining two old ones. And I think there's lots of improvements that we could have in fracking technology. And, and whatever we can do to green up to push the technology, I think, is, is a key thing we want to do. So I think we have a lot of room to be made in terms of improved technology. Uh, and increasing pricing as we move down to these unconventional resources is something we need to be concerned about. So these are, uh, here's oil prices up top, and here's natural gas prices here. And I think what has been missing from the story of this drilling boom is it's not really a technology-driven boom. It's a price-driven boom. You can have all the technology you want, but if the prices aren't high enough, you're not going to pull that stuff out of the ground. So this started in 2001 with natural gas, and we had lots of spikes. There's arguments that this was caused by Enron. Hedge fund managers got caused these guys. But there was price spikes that put natural gas way into double digits. And that's what drove the boom, is the high prices. Same thing with oil. Boom. So when I did that Arctic report in 2001, and I reviewed seven forecasts for oil prices from all the major firms, no one, through 2020, no one predicted oil prices above $30 a barrel. And we've been well above that the whole time. So the high prices are what's making domestic drilling affordable. At least it, it, it drew in the capital to be where we are now. The technology was there, but it's the high prices that uh, have really fueled this thing. So if this stuff is expensive to get out of the ground, or it was expensive to invest in, it might be getting cheaper as technology improves, but uh, it's not, we may never go back to uh, this cheap oil. We're back down to cheap natural gas because there's a glut, but uh, they're hurting and they need prices to go up to get more out of the ground. And this is just a nice little story because this is rotary rigs for oil, and this is rotary rigs for uh, natural gas. And you can see, 2001, you had the spikes in natural gas. Boom, it dropped down, and then huge, and then natural gas prices collapsed. And what happened? All the rigs went to oil. So in Colorado, that meant that they went from Grand Junction and Rifle to the Front Range, because we got oil in the Front Range. So. Uh, this really explains why you had a bust in Grand Junction. It's not the new regs that were passed at the state level. It's the collapse of natural gas prices and the switch into uh, oil rotary rigs. Currently, only 20% of the rigs in the U.S. are drilling for natural gas. So the question of what I have, the rest are drilling for oil. If we were to have a, we had a recent spike in natural gas, it sort of settled down. But if we had a big spike in natural gas and we had to go start drilling more, would that spike get higher because all the rigs are drilling for oil and we have a sort of a shortage of rigs? So this is a very interesting report. This came out in 2011. This is a report out of MIT. And uh, our current Secretary of Energy was a director of this report. This report had, I think, at least two congressional hearings because it was from MIT. It was the future of natural gas, highly publicized. Uh, but this, Appendix 2C, buried in the back, I graphed the cost curves. So this is, uh, you got your 90% uh, probability, your, your mean, and your 10% probability. But what you have is dramatically increasing prices. In order to get that 100-year supply out of the ground, according to MIT studies, we're going to have to go really high in price. Well, if this is true, we need to have this part of our discussion. Because I worry about locking in power plants into what could be a very expensive supply source. So when you talk about a 100-year supply of technical recoverable, how much of it can get extracted at current prices, and how high do prices have to go to get it all to the ground? Those, those are basic economic questions that have really not been asked for 12 years. I've been trying to ask them, but they're not covered much. Excuse me, could you explain the difference between what the 
Uh, this is a 90 percent probabilistic. So you have probabilistic models. So this is a 90 percent. So this is very accurate. This is sort of a 90 percent probability of being accurate, so it, which means it's smaller. And this is a 5 percent. So this is or a 10 percent. <clears throat> so this is very optimistic. But it gives you a range. Like let's say, <clears throat> so the the 100 year estimate is based on a mean. They just give you a mean. So anyway, it just shows you that wow, if this this is really accurate, maybe we have a lot less than we think, and it's more expensive than we think. Mm -hmm. Uh, but at the same time, so we have increasing cost curves for fossil fuels, and we have decreasing cost curves for renewable energy. And at some point, they're going to cross, and at some point, continuing to invest in fossil fuels may not be economic for a uh, utility. And so this needs to be a part of the discussion. <coughs> so I, I, when I was in graduate school, I uh, wrote computer code. and. Uh, Fortran, the ancient language. Um, but uh, when I first started, I was writing code, and then we'd send it off to the green machine. And the green machine took up a whole building. And you'd send it off, and you'd wait a couple hours, or maybe a couple days, and you'd get it back, and then you'd have a syntax error, and you'd repeat the process. And it's very frustrating. Uh, but when I finished my dissertation, and I wrote a computer simulation model for my dissertation, I was compiling the code on my laptop, I mean, desktop, it was a 386, uh, at my desk in seconds. And that's over a six year period, when you think about how rapidly the technology changed. When I left CSU, they were, they paid over a million bucks for the green machine. And they were trying to auction it off. I think they sold it to the University of Minnesota for like $50,000, like for scrap metal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I view fossil fuels and a centralized power as buying a mainframe computer. And I think the real gains are going to be in distributed energy and renewable energy. And that's the laptops of the future. So it may not be now, but I think in a few years, we're going to be regretting investing too much into uh, mainframe computer. So back to this graph, these lines I added. So if you look at this quote from uh, Nicholas Stern, and it talks about market failure. One of the things that happens in economics is when the costs aren't fully internalized into the marginal cost curve, the supply curve, you have what's called a market failure. One of the great assumptions, heroic assumptions in economics is all costs are included in the supply curve. Well, that just never happens. You either got to tax it or regulate it or account, uh, have a firm being a good steward. So you have market failure, and he calls the greenhouse gas emissions a huge market failure. So as we move down the resource triangle, we're going to have increasing negative externalities. There was a science paper uh, two years ago that looked at this. Uh, decreasing energy return on investment, very energy intensive uh, fuels to get out. So you sort of have this quandary of higher prices along with higher, more energy needed, which could then drive prices higher. So you, more energy is needed to extract some of these resources. And then increasing greenhouse gas emissions as they tend to be dirtier and require more energy. So a few years ago, uh, this is my attempt at categorizing the externalities, the negative externalities that come with oil and gas. And I don't have time to cover them all, but a lot of them are very real. And I think the science is catching up. What I see is articles coming out, some of the research coming out of CU is just sort of re reaffirming some of the things that we talked about 10 years ago. And uh, you know, NOxs and VOCs, uh, ozone. Uh, displacement of, of farms, if we have water that's used for fracking, less for farmers, um, off-site damages. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about fragmentation, and then just loss of wildlands. I mean, I, I'm a wilderness guy, and, and uh, I don't want to hike. I mean, there's some places in Utah I don't, I don't go anymore because there's oil and gas wells. I mean, it's fine, but it's sort of a single use, so you don't, I don't want to go hike or camp near that. So it's important to include the stuff in our discussion. And it, it, this, these are not exclusive to oil and gas. Wind has big problems. Solar has big problems. You've got strip mines. I mean, every energy source has these externalities. 
It just needs to be a part of the discussion. And back to the pace and scale, one way of controlling these externalities is to really keep in touch with that pace and scale and start small, monitor, and expand. If we, if we don't find anything, then great, let's move it a little bigger. I'm just going to cover three. Uh, there's only one peer-reviewed study right now on property values, and they found that uh, residential properties four kilometers from oil and gas have a decline of four to eight percent. And I know there's a study out of University of Denver that's going on. It's a very straight met forward methodology. I'm surprised there aren't more studies. I'm sure they'll be coming. Economists need publications too. Uh, but there's no doubt in Boulder County, if you have an oil and gas well next to your house, you're having a drop in property value. And that is a market failure in the sense that that drop in property value is not being compensated for to that landowner by the oil and gas industry. <clears throat> There's also increased truck traffic. This is a study of uh, Douglas County and Boulder County. They estimated, it's a very truck intensive industry, and they estimated 33 to 45,000 per well in additional costs for taxpayers. And one of the challenges is that these, there's a delay in which you get revenues. You have these costs up front, and then somewhere down the line you're hoping to get the oil and gas revenues to pay for this. And that lag puts some fiscal challenges to communities. And uh, the Douglas County study, interestingly, showed that the faster the drilling, the deeper the fiscal hole for the community, and the longer it took them to break even. They did break even eventually, but the longer it takes you to break even, the more risk you're going to have fiscally. And, and just to touch on that point again, when you see revenues, you see the report every year. They'll come out and say, oh, the state got this much in royalty revenues or whatever. Those are gross revenues. They're not net revenues. It took us some cost to get those revenues. We had increased road maintenance costs. We had to hire inspectors. We had to do something. So whenever that number comes out, just remember, that's gross revenue. It's not net revenue. I have not seen a study that has looked at the net revenue from oil and gas to see if it's actually positive. <coughs> at the federal level, it's positive. <coughs> at the state level, it's probably positive. At a community level, I would say it's probably negative, depending on the community. But the calculus is never done correctly. No one cares. If you're in business, nobody cares about gross revenues. You can't survive on gross revenues. It's net revenues that matter. So why we are still reporting gross revenues for oil and gas makes no sense. Uh, this is a study out of the Wyoming Department of Health. They found a 3% increase in clinic visits uh, from increase in ground level ozone. This came after uh, the drilling up in the Jonah field outside Pinedale. So this is the first study that started putting some economic cost on to the high cost of ozone. And there's several, the Clean Air Act actually was a boondoggle for economists to start estimating ozone costs. There's lots of historic studies, but this is a more recent one on uh, oil and gas. So that's included in the net? Uh, then, oh. uh, that would, yes, this cost should be included in that, but it's not. So then, fugitive emissions. This is uh, becoming a big issue. This is just some examples of what we're talking about. Uh, Pinedale up in Wyoming, you had a lot of VOCs coming from oil and gas operations. The Natural Resource Council estimated uh, hidden costs from burning fossil fuels, $120 billion per year. Never kind of included in the calculus. So, but these are the type of future emissions we've got to be concerned about. And this is the natural gas infrastructure. I think the biggest mistake the environmental community made was to tell everyone that we could cut our CO2 in half by just switching to natural gas. That's only if you focus on the power plant. And we are increasingly finding that you have to focus elsewhere too. You have leaky pipelines, you got compressor stations, you got stuff releasing at the wellhead. So I think I think we all thought we had a free lunch. I thought we could deal with climate policy by just switching to natural gas and 50% reduction in CO2. It's just, it's just not that easy. 
So this is the most recent study I've seen. This came out in February. And uh, the, the key conclusion here is that measurements at all scales show that official inventories consistently underestimate <coughs> methane emissions. So I think once we start looking at this stuff, we're going to see a lot more of these problems come up. You know, we thought, I think oil and gas has been so important to our economy that we've sort of turned a blind eye. The public good is always greater than the public bad, so let's just keep on going. And as it gets closer to people's homes, that's no longer the case. We're going to be, we already have an NSF grant. We've got a lot of scientists looking at this stuff, and we're going to start seeing, you know, what, what, what it really involves. But this is, this is a good study just came out in Science Magazine. They looked at, uh, it was sort of a meta-analysis of 20 different studies. So now we'll go to wildlife. So one of the things we were concerned about, this was 2003, was the footprint of an oil and gas field. So this is a mature oil and gas field, uh, fully developed in Wyoming, big body of large. And uh, so we digitized it and looked at the infrastructure. And we were concerned about the impact on wildlife. And um, 1,400 miles of linear features, seven square mile physical footprint. And, uh, but we digitized it and came up with a couple of metrics. So we had uh, two different metrics, a one mile square grid and a four mile square grid, looking at linear features. Road density is a huge issue for wildlife. You get above uh, three miles, six miles, a square mile of road, and very fragmented environment. Conservation biology has looked at this for years in forestry, and they've never really looked at an oil and gas. As far as we can tell, we did the first analysis of habitat fragmentation on an, on an oil and gas field. And it's sort of like foresters used to think edge was the thing. So we clear cut, and we created edge, until you realize we had too much edge. And then conservation biologists came in and said, well, you actually need core habitat for wildlife. And, and, but it, just because it's forestry, it also applies in, in the sage grouse systems. So a very fragmented environment. But if you look at the conservation biology literature, you actually have to add uh, a buffer onto your roads because you have a distance from a road or an oil and gas well from which wildlife is impacted. So this is sort of a review of some of the literature. So sage grouse, obligate birds, uh, 328 from a feet from a road. So you want to put a buffer on the road. So you can't just look, when you're looking at fragmentation, you can't just look at the direct road impacts. You've got to sort of add on the infrastructure, infrastructure effect zone. Uh, so distance, so we added some, so you have a 0.6 miles from the nearest road for pronghorn, bighorn sheep, 433. So what we did is we then ran that, we took, we took this graph, and then added buffers onto it to see what the core habitat was. And this is what it looks like. So this is, has a 250 foot buffer on, on the infrastructure. And this one has a quarter mile. And at this point, you don't have any core habitat. So if you're going to fully develop your oil and gas field, you've sort of displaced the wildlife values. Of course, you could do restoration and conservation and reclamation to help backfill. But it just shows you uh, how little core habitat there is uh, when you intensely develop. Now, one thing that this can help out on is directional drilling. You can actually reduce your fragmentation if you directionally drill. And so, there, so this is where technology can come in and help reduce some of these wildlife impacts. So then, so that, that covered scale, okay? So we looked at a full scale, we said, man, if it gets a really big scale, there's no wildlife habitat left. So then this is the, uh, the Jonah Field um, in Wyoming, also Pinedale, Wind River Range up here. That's what it looks like from the air. And this has happened in five years. Now, the BLM in its environmental impact statement said that they ran it over a 20-year period, and they said, all right, we're going to have this many wells over a 20-year period, and there won't be any significant impact. But they didn't put anything in the plan to sort of say, 
to regulate the pace and scale. So industry said, well, great. So they went in and in five years drilled all the wells that were supposed to be drilled in 20 years and then wanted more. So this, when we saw this, we realized you really need to regulate the pace. No matter how good your BMPs are, no matter how good your air quality regs are, if you don't regulate the pace and scale, you're not controlling for cumulative impacts. And your assessment, if this drilling had been done over 20 years, you'd have replacement habitat, you'd have some seeding being done, and you would have wildlife adapting, you'd have more time for that. And so the assumption of no significant impact might be valid if over a longer period of time. But over five years, much different, much different. We ended up digitizing this, <coughs> and we created a predictive model of habitat fragmentation uh, based on well spacing. So I'm not going to show you to you here, but this is so now if you know well spacing, you can sort of predict fragmentation. And the question is, you know, why do we care? Well, if you want to see, go to Yellowstone and see critters, you got to take care of their habitat. And this is the habitat, Wind River Range up here, and this is the wildlife habitat. This is their wintering grounds. So it's not in someone's backyard, but I'm saying wherever we drill, it's in someone's backyard. And there's no place now in the world that's out of sight, out of mind. Our consumption decisions are, have to be very visible. We can no longer be blissfully ignorant of sort of, I'm consuming something, I don't know what happens. So, you know, we got to watch out for wildlife too. Anyway, so we developed a predictive model. What we were trying to get the BLM to do was to um, estimate where drilling was going to occur and what the impact was going to be. And they came back and said, well, we don't know where the wells are going to be, but there won't be any impact. And that's a very dissatisfying answer for a scientist. So we developed methods for estimating hypothetical build-out. And then <coughs> we ran them up, and this is in Moffat County, and we ran them for uh, up in the, the, the plan up there, <coughs> uh, different scenarios. So we used the, the model to, for each of the plan alternatives to estimate the impact of wildlife. Agencies out, outmanned, and we have the technology. <coughs> the other thing we learned was, uh, Pine Dale rifle some of the drilling booms. Now we'll move back into economics, out of wildfire. <laughs> increased road traffic, increased crime. <clears throat> this is from a paper Jeffrey Jacquet did. He's now at Cornell finishing his PhD. But <clears throat> direct predictor between the crime index and the number of drilling rigs operating in Sublette County. <clears throat> this is uh, from BBC Research, looking at rifle and how much the infrastructure was need, was going to be needed during the boom. Uh, we had workers fill hotels, which is great, but if tourists were there, uh, you displaced them. There was a <coughs> the Wyoming Tourism Board actually put out a notice about, <coughs> don't come to Wyoming, there's no rooms, which hurts tourism. I mean, it's great for the hotel owner. So let's say you fill 100 rooms with oil and gas workers, and you normally fill 70 rooms with tourists. <coughs> you can't say that oil and gas industry created those 100. It's, created that additional 30, because you displaced 70. So you've got to get the math right when you're talking about jobs. <coughs> and then the resource curse is something else to be concerned about. And this is simply that uh, counties and countries that have focused on resource extraction have slower growth. This is something Jeffrey Sachs came up with uh, several years ago. And uh, Headwaters Economics has found evidence in the Rockies. There's been two recent studies, a 2011 study and a 2007 study in the US. One at the county level and one at the state level. And here's the resource, here's the references. And both of them found evidence of the resource curse. So in terms of an economic development strategy, you want to be careful about what you ask for. And we think that slowing the pace and scale down actually will address some of the issues with the resource curse. So we're talking about responsible oil and gas development. And what, as I said at the beginning, we're applying this stuff from renewable resources to non-renewable resources. <clears throat> so we want to avoid the human cost and also protect our natural amenities. <clears throat> so <clears throat> natural amenity development, and I have about 30 years of peer-reviewed research on this I could give you, but I'm not going to give it to you now. But the idea is that what we got in Colorado is a lot of natural amenities. It's a really sweet place to live. That's why I live here. We got a lot of places to hike, a lot of places to recreate. 
And what it does is it combines, you get a high skilled labor force. So what we have is businesses come into Colorado because we have a very educated workforce. And a lot of us stay here because it's a really nice place to live. And economists call that the second paycheck. You get your paycheck at work and then you get to go up and go mountain biking or you get to go hiking. And my second paycheck is about two thirds of my total paycheck because I really like to go ski. Small businesses and entrepreneurs, obviously recreation and tourism, and then retirees. Most people think this is just what we're talking about, but it's much bigger than that. And one of the things we have in Colorado, we can't compete with New York or LA or the coast on sort of cultural cities, but we can match them for amenities. This is the sweetest state in the Rockies to live in. And here's some job trends. Uh, so real quickly, this is for the five uh, states in the Rockies. First graph is government, and then we got retail and wholesale. Here's healthcare, here's accommodations, and uh, mining, oil, and gas is down here. So it's not the driver at the state level in terms of jobs for the Rockies. And then this graph, we get into total personal income. So this is different than jobs. This brings in income, and you can see retirement and investment income. People who retire here bring their accumulated wealth and spend it locally. So it's a huge part of our total personal income. Here's sort of uh, the recreation sector here. And uh, then this is sort of the professional uh, high quality workforce. And then mining oil and gas is up here at 2%. Because once again, this is for the five state Rockies. And then we'll bring it closer to home. So this graph is for the Rockies. This graph is for Colorado. And this graph is for Boulder County. And as you go from left to right, you get into increasing levels of natural amenity development. There's no doubt. Boulder is a heavily based natural amenity community. And it's a hotbed of economic activity. And a very nice place to live and expensive. And you can see, if you highlight it in red, the, you know, the in increasing trends. Professional technical services gets up here. Uh, information technology increases. Uh, arts and recreation entertainment increases. And oil and gas drops down. So it's important to protect our natural amenities for our economy. So maintaining our environment is a prerequisite for sustainable economic development in Colorado. And to the extent that oil and gas threatens that, we need to be concerned just from an economic perspective. So, real quickly, I'll jump into these oil and gas jobs. So, there's been uh, five studies uh, that looked at oil and gas. They used Implan, which is an economic input, input output model. And the, the job estimates range from 71,000 up to 213,000 jobs. This is the same model, the same industry, the same state. The only thing that changed was the data and the assumptions. You have a consulting firm in PricewaterhouseCooper wanting to keep their client happy. Very generous assumptions. Up to 213,000 jobs. So it just shows you how much variability you can create when you're trying to generate job estimates just by changing your assumptions. I estimate about 28,000 jobs, and that's all just the direct jobs. Mm -hmm. The implant estimates indirect and induced. So the key things there are the assumptions matter that go into this implant model. So the implant, you, you take your direct jobs, which is its government data, and then you run it through the implant, you get your indirect, and then you get your induced, and then you get total estimated jobs. How you define your direct jobs is probably the key for increasing or decreasing uh, the number of jobs. There's lots of other assumptions in this model which uh, make it, it's a static model trying to estimate jobs in a dynamic economy. And it just is, it's a, everyone uses it and it's just a horrible model. I'll just <laughs> say it there. So this is from the 2007 study from the School of Mines, just to show you what, what the jobs involve. So the direct jobs in oil and gas were only about 15,000 of that 70,000. So what's really wrong is to say, oh, the oil and gas industry employs 71,000 jobs. They don't. They contribute to the economy that has indirect and induced jobs that support this. Now, when this report came out, it was immediately spun by the oil and gas industry that 
oil and gas is the number one industry in the state. And there's nothing in this report to support that. It was a spin job. The next thing you know, Governor Ritter is saying it's the most important industry in the state, and there's no data to support that. Uh, but this was the best report because they actually surveyed companies to find out where they were spending their money. You could take sort of off-the-shelf standard stuff from Implant or you can go and actually survey companies to see who they're hiring. And they found a very low multiplier for extra PN space and a multiplier of 1.09. You want one over two. It means how long the money circulates in the economy. Which means you have a lot of out-of-state contractors and a lot of crews that are coming in from out of state. That's, a, that's basically sucking economic activity out of the state and sending it to Texas or Oklahoma or wherever they're from. Not a very good way to develop your economy. If you slow it down by regulating the pace and scale, you'll actually have a chance to have local businesses, local entrepreneurs be a part of the industry and, and increase that multiplier. And a lot of stuff leaking out of the state. At the, at the state level, you had 79% uh, of the revenue gone out of the state. So, something to be concerned about. So once again, symmetry and analysis. If we're going to, what, what, they, what the studies have done is taken what were formerly indirect jobs and included them as direct jobs. And if we're going to do that methodology, then we should do it for all the other industries. So, outdoor recreation should include REA, retail jobs and Neptune jobs and as direct jobs. The microbreweries should include the liquor stores and the chip industry should use off Home Depot. So if we're going to, you know, basically you can't have one industry use one method, which is a brand new method, and everyone else use another method and then compare them. And if you were to do this method, you would probably estimate more jobs than actually exist. <laughs> So I'll, I'll skip through this, but these are some of the questions you want to ask. Uh, when you estimate jobs, there's no guarantee they're going to be local jobs. There's no guarantee that they're local residents. Uh, how did they define it? Was there any sensitivity analysis? And then how are other industries impacted? Real quickly, uh, this is what happens. You get displaced. So we have an advantage where we, we create natural many jobs and natural gas jobs. And if you increase your scale of oil and gas too much, this is a production possibility curve in economics. Uh, you actually can displace jobs, like when people are displaced from hotels. So the key is looking at net job growth. So when a model comes in and estimates jobs, that's gross jobs. Did anyone have to leave? So something to think about. So back to the subject of the talk. So what we're trying to do is pr promote more sustainable economic development. This is not about banning fracking. This is not about stopping oil and gas. This is about applying some forestry and non uh, renewable concepts to a non-renewable resource. Avoid the resource curse, protect your natural amenities, internalize your externalities, uh, reduce your hazard, and then compensate our grandchildren for fossil fuels that could have been used for something very valuable. So, real quickly. Uh, so phase energy development is basically placing some places off limits, capping wells, regulating the pace and scale. And one of the advantages of this is you can't expand the scale unless you have monitoring results come in and say there's no significant impact. And this provides sort of a built-in mechanism for doing monitoring because monitoring and data collection has never been a priority. But if you make it so that you can't expand your drilling in, until you collect that data, then you have a built-in mechanism for doing that. And if you cap the number of wells, you can control for cumulative effects. Uh, and this actually can address another problem because uh, you would provide an incentive for closure of old wells. And old wells can be a big problem as a conduit for uh, pollution, water pollution. So this is what it looks like. This is from an article from 2009. And basically you're just trying to moderate the boom and bust by spreading it out over a longer period of time. And this provides more community stability, which is always a big issue in forestry. Community stability is a very big issue in forestry and boom and bust is not what you want. So trying to moderate this out over time, this is what it would look like. And then we added 
So this was, we developed this concept based on what was going on in Pinedale and Rifle, small rural communities. And then when we moved to the front range, we added the precautionary principle because you're moving into a much higher populated area where the hazards are uh, close to much higher populations. So then we added the precautionary principle, which is simply try not to do any harm and uh, go slow. Which means we want to establish a baseline level of harm, which is simply understanding what's happened in the past. How many wells are still there? Have they been capped? Have they been properly restored? So what's our baseline level of harm, from which then we want to decide whether we want to add anything? Uh, you take plausible precautionary actions, you know, landowner education, you update your land use plans, you might pass a moratorium, which might give you time to collect baseline data. And you know, good governance and due diligence requires this. So we added the precautionary principle in as sort of a guidance for the for uh, phase development. And I won't go into this, that's too much for getting late. But the idea is that there's lots of advantages of slowing down and, and doing it right. But the third thing we added was sort of an economic incentives. So you gotta have a hammer to keep people in line and performance bonds, royalty rates, increased fines, etc. Market forces, we're talking about this with, in Boulder. I'm just going to focus on two tonight, which are performance bonds and royalty rates. And this is a, unlike coal mining, where bonds are site specific, in oil and gas you have statewide bonds or nationwide bonds. And they have not been updated since the 50s. If you just update them for inflation, that would be a huge improvement. Uh, $25,000 for a statewide bond. Uh, one pad could be $25,000 for reclamation. Uh, 150000 for a nationwide bond. So ridiculously low amounts. And, and, and bonding is there to help local communities clean up the mess. We got this problem out here at the Butte, and we're paying because there's no money left. <coughs> Bonding is a huge advantage for internalizing the cost because if the good actors are out there doing it right, they get their bonds back. If you've got a bad actor, the community has some money to help restore. We've got a lot of abandoned wells in, in the nation that, you know, it's no different than all the mining scars you see up uh, you know, by Idaho Springs. There's no money there. They're long gone and we're having to foot the bill. And I worry about going too quickly with oil and gas and having a lot of abandoned wells that eventually we'll have to clean up. So one of the things we're recommending is site-specific bonding. So you tailor the bonding amount to the site. If it's a high-risk site, <coughs> you increase your bonding amount. If it's a low-risk site, you could have a lower bonding amount. Uh, it would be if you're going closer to schools, or you have higher reclamation sites, or maybe in a floodplain, you might increase your bonding amount. The other advantage is it keeps the money local. It stays there. The bonding stays with the site. So that county or that community will have money. It doesn't go with a company and then you have a shell game and, and it's gone. So we really think that site-specific bonding would be a, a huge improvement for internalizing the cost and weeding out the bad actors from, from the good actors. And then how do we pay for all this stuff? We did an analysis of uh, royalty rates. And this is what we pay uh, you know, the government for the rights on federal land. Current rate is 12.5%. Uh, and this is for uh, 2012, one year. So if we were to increase the rate up to 16.6%, uh, Colorado would get $37 million. If we raised up here, we get $54 million. If we go to 25%, $110 million. We got some fiscal problems in this state, and this is a big chunk of money. And that's just from one year. So how do we pay for the monitoring, the baseline data, the inspectors, et cetera? Increasing royalty rates is one potential way of doing that. So in summary, this is just basically my abstract again. But the idea is these are not new concepts. And we believe that it has a framework that is more responsible than what we've seen in the past. I think we can solve some of our problems. We don't want to drive each other crazy, and this might be sort of a, a way forward. And I'll skip these questions. 
and go to my last slide. So when you're backcountry skiing, you take precautions. So we collected baseline data because we looked at the avalanche reports. We looked at the weather patterns. We expanded our pace and scale by doing runs down low on less steep slopes. And we monitored. I was with two avalanche forecasters, and we collected more data. We dug a pit. We had beacons and everything. We had adaptive management, baseline data, phase development, and then we leaped. And that's all we're asking. So for years and years, I gave a presentation called Look Before You Leap Off the Natural Gas Bridge. And all I was asking was sort of ask these types of questions. And that was a great scheme. <laughs> so to do this stuff safely, just taking some precautions and, and being smart about it. If you want more information, there's my email address. There's Joe's. Uh, this is a brand new nonprofit we just started, Conservation Economics Institute. Uh, if you want more information on wildlife impacts, go to Restoring the West. In 2012, they had a whole conference on wildlife impacts. All the wildlife biologists were there. I'm an economist, so I'm just sort of talking about it. Uh, but there's at least a dozen really good PowerPoint presentations and presentations there on Restoring the West. Uh, here's a YouTube video of my presentation. And then uh, our Longmont, you can download another uh, presentation I gave there last uh, April. So I will stop there and take questions. Okay. Um, here's uh, a few questions that are sort of more of a clarification. I mean, could you describe the resource curse a little more and what it is and what it happens what happens to local communities with it? The resource curse is uh, communities that uh, focus on too much on resource extraction have slower growth rates. And that's, in, in a nutshell, that's what it is. There's also been associated with higher corruption of public officials and uh, crowding out of other economic sectors. And everyone thinks it's sort of uh, the bonanza, so they forget about everyone else and jumps into the game, and then you get bust. And so you have sort of an uneven development pattern. But it's mostly associated with just sort of slower growth. And, and I think there's several articles, but the two that I reference are the first two I've seen that looked at the state and the uh, county level in the U.S. So it's slower growth rates associated with too much emphasis on resource extraction. Can you expand on how directional drilling can result in less fragmentation and therefore increase biodiversity and wildlife success? How does that, uh, how does this take into account where shale deposits are? I think my thought on that is uh, rather than going down to five acre spacing, which is what they were doing up in the Jonah field, if you do directional, you're maybe at 40 or 60 or 80 acre spacing. So you're having fewer, bigger well pads, but fewer smaller well pads, fewer connected roads, less fragmentation. I, I haven't done the study. I, it's just intuitive that if you were to do directional drilling at a less well spacing than what's been done at five acre spacing, you'd have better for the wildlife. What is distributed energy, as mentioned in the slide? That's part of putting stuff on rooftops distributed power on rooftops and solar and things like that, All sort of creating a grid that's not centralized with a power plant. A major issue in current asthma management is alteration of the human microbiome. How might fracking affect air, land, water that could alter the human microbiome in the, in the, gut, oh, the gut and the airway? And we always reserve the right to say, as we said last night, we don't know what Tarrant County is, we can't. So, okay, but now expanding uh, that concept in ways that won't, that might be encouraging here for you. Um, okay, so animals of all si sizes have a microbiome as well. Theirs would probably be affected as well and could change their health and longevity. So I think we're uh, shifting here to what's it? from habitat studies and wildlife to health impacts on wildlife. 
Okay. 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 So they were heading a little bit more. It's a, a very interesting and lively comment here, which is to me. So, will you bring uh, Mr. Worth, Martin, and Mr. Martin together at the same forum? So, that's and that's for me. So, and I don't know. The answer to that question is I don't know. Now, a couple of questions about. Okay, under your pace and scale model, can a company reasonably expect to attract sufficient capital from investors to begin a multi-year development program? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a good research question. I, I really think, so what is the, you know, you talk about the minimum economic field in, in, in economic geology, sort of how much do you need to attract that capital? And so what would be that pace and scale that would be needed to be able to start? That, that, that's a very good question. And I think it's sort of site specific. How rich is that site, and what else is there, and how 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 full, how much, uh, what's the cost of capital? If, if you guys don't mind, can I add to that question? Mm -hmm. uh, globally, I was very fortunate at young age to live in Europe, and I think we as Americans get skewed that the price of oil is so low because it's backed by American dollars. So how do you gauge globally what the price of energy is? Europeans at the pump might pay eight, eight to ten bucks. We complain about a fifty percent rise. So what is the true difference, you know, globally with the nuances between gas and, and oil? I mean, it's different for, you know, if you're in Norway or... Yeah, they have much higher taxes. Yeah. Much higher taxes in, in, in Europe. So, so, so what's, what would be a good analysis for the U.S. to compare what if gas to get into high, but if it was at $5, it might be very good for the rest of the world. So wouldn't part of growing at a slow rate is getting better margin on our gas as we export it? That, that very well could be. That, that very well could be. And I think what what we need in the U.S., I mean, when this drilling boom started, gas was a buck fifty a gallon. And we had congressional hearings when it approached $2 in California. Outrage. And now we're just sort of numb, like, oh, it's three fifty. I guess. i got to pay that. But... We had an economy for years and years and years that was based on a buck fifty, buck less gas. And if we're going to be now, if we're permanently now up above three fifty or four without any tax increase, if this is just going to be our new norm, we need to tune up the economy because that changes lots of things in terms of centralized distribution systems. It might actually favor local economies and local people who can grow stuff locally don't have high transportation costs. But it sort of changes everything. And this idea that drill here, drill them out, pay less, I think quite work out for oil. And in fact, if you run a graph on how many drill, how many wells we drilled in oil prices, the more we drill, the higher prices go. So slowing down would make sense because you might actually have better margins and more profit. I don't know. What? It's, good, good. it's a really good research question. He looks young enough to go out and do the research. <laughs> you might just do it. So. Let us know, Admiral. Yes, indeed. Thank you for taking your mission here. What if, What is the number one industry in Colorado? Government. It's not really an industry, but we got a lot of government. I, I would say uh, I would say recreation and tourism is pretty high up there. I would think telecommunications would be the other one. It, 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 it all depends on how you lump. But you know, recreation, I, I, recreation and tourism is huge, and it's very sustainable. People come here all the time. They ski, and now that we got marijuana, geez Louise, we got a comparative advantage over any other state for skiers. Trust me. <laughs> Such useful advice comes from these um, investors. Will start attending fracking sets and big time here for this. Uh, a couple more clarification questions. What are the bonds for, and who buys them? Bonds are for it to cover reclamation costs. They're covered closure of the wells, those type of things. When you buy them from insurance companies or banks or other ones, and it's, it's one of the most effective mechanisms for internalizing the cost because it's dollar value that's there, it stays with the site, and if you don't do it right, you don't get your bond back and there's money to clean it up. And it actually is a very good mechanism for weeding out bad actors from good actors because if you got a big bond amount, you're going to take it, you're slow. You're going to be careful about it and make sure you do it right because you want to get your bond back. And if and so I, I just think it's a, it's a great way to make sure that we don't have this abandoned mine problem that we got in Colorado that Udall's trying to fix 
that we don't have an abandoned oil and gas well problem uh, because of inadequate bonding. Uh, this one, I could probably use a couple more words from the writer here. Sort of a poem, I guess, more. And so it's royalty rates, colon, total or additional revenue? Oh, that was additional revenue. That was the additional revenue from raising royalty rates. It wasn't a poem. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, some kind of general, more sort of policy-oriented questions here. Uh, the notion of distributed power is interesting. Oh, no, that's not what I... Well, okay. Yes, yeah, so this is policy. Excuse me. The notion of distributed power is interesting, but as we have seen with computers, the distribution of laptops goes to well-off communities. How will this approach make sure that we don't create energy poverty? I think, I think what we need is to take on the idea of a natural monopoly. So natural monopoly was something that economists use years ago to justify large utilities. So rather than having a bunch of utilities, they say, well, this is a natural monopoly. Most economists are against monopolies, but in the utility sense, they say, oh, it's a natural monopoly because there's sort of a economies of scale, and it's more efficient if we just have one provider. And I don't think that's valid anymore. And if you want to open up the market to address energy poverty, then having people be able to invest in rooftops in poor communities and not worry that they're violating the monopoly power plant company would be a great way of doing that. Right now, capital is limited because you can't go invest in these places because they have a natural monopoly. Like, if, even if Boulder was to create its own municipality, it would be a natural monopoly. And so taking on at the state level and getting rid of the natural monopoly would actually free up capital to flow to those areas that have poverty so that the Boulderites could do their, put their heart and their money in the right place and go invest in some place that needs it to, to address energy poverty. Well, this is an affectionate note here. Uh, I read hostile notes in a hostile manner, so I guess I should. <laughs> Dear Dr. Morton, um, I, I'm not, this is a very earnest thing. I shouldn't I seem to be making fun of it. I don't mean, okay, thank you. What do our Colorado state regulators say when you give them this wonderful presentation? <laughs> they may not say, Dear Dr. Morton. <clears throat> they haven't asked me. <laughs> is that right? Who are Colorado state regulators? Who would that? That would be Matt McCord. Okay, yeah, oh. yeah, no, no. Maybe we, we may not be able to get Tim Worth and Jim Martin and you back together, but we might be able to help a little bit on that last one. Um, so don't send your schedule in just yet to the Colorado state regulators, but we may be able to help there. Um, our, le our leaders might care deeply about long term economic and environmental damage, but they often fail voters with short-term demands. How would you recommend that our poli our policymakers navigate this conundrum? But they often, that might not be the word, so uh, they often not uh, fail, but um, sell or sell or whatever. Well, anyway, there's a verb there. They, what is that verb? How? They often sucker voters. <laughs> they do, okay, so what they're doing, we can do this, uh, and I'm sorry. How do you get politicians to take long term? Yeah, because they are pushed by voters sometimes to just respond in short term ways, so how do the policymakers deal with that conundrum? That was perfectly clear, sorry. You have to get rid of campaign finance reform and get real people running for office. Really, because you just get these characters out there that have been so bought and sold by the time they get up that they're not, they're just, they're already bought and sold and they're only thinking long term. You're not going to get Mr. Smith goes to Washington anymore because no one wants to sit there and shake hands for 24 hours at 7. I'd rather write a bill and actually put your, you know, your thoughts to work than to go and have to raise money all the time. Right now, it's the staff of most of these people that are writing bills. It's not these. They're up there you know, shaking hands and raising money. It's the, that's what the game is. And so when you're in that type of environment, you're not thinking long term. You're just thinking, how do I get reelected? And so it's, it's a big problem. Governor, you could remember in the Colorado oil and gas industry recently, or some sectors of the Colorado oil and gas industry recently announced new mutually supported regulations, which they claim are the toughest in the nation. Are those claims credible? If not, what do you advocate as an alternative? <clears throat> no, from what I understand on the air quality, uh, I understand they're, they're very good regulations. Uh, and, and we should be applaud what's been done. 
but once again, it's necessary but not sufficient, to use an economic phrase. It's necessary to get these good air quality regs, but it's not sufficient, because even if we have the best regs, if the pace and scale go sky high, we're going to have bad air problems. It's no different than in forestry. You've got great BMPs, but if you increase your pace and scale, you've got a denuded watershed. So it's, it's a nice first start. It's nice to see, but it, we should not stop there. And that's why we think the two key variables are to allow local communities at some point to regulate the pace and scale and, and to try to address that. So. Couldn't you shift the hypocrisy curve even more to the right by drilling in Boulder County, same consumption, even lower hypocrisy? Yeah, no, I, that, that's true. I, I'm, I'm for local energy. I, 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 think, I think we need to seriously think about the problem of exporting our environmental problems someplace else. I mean, I might, when I talk to folks in Pinedale and down in Walsenburg and other rural communities that, oh, well, you know, we're, we're banning this in Boulder, they're like, well, you're going to screw us. And so we need to really think about our consumption here in Boulder. And if we have gas, then maybe we should think about a way of getting it out. It may not be with the current technology. Maybe we want to push that technology to something besides just combining two old technologies. But I do think it's incumbent to think about local power. And, and, and if we have it, I think it would address our hypocrisy. Yeah. Uh, and then I have a, just, two, just two of my own here, which is, I don't know that I've ever encountered or even thought of an economist using analogies as effectively and as persuasively as you do. Maybe there's a literary school of economists using analogies in a creative and persuasive way that I, I want to know their names if that's the case. But I wonder, that's very effective, your mainframe laptop analogy, very effective, your backcountry skiing thing. Uh, as a user of analogies myself, kind of manipulating sometimes. I, I'm sort of choosing an analogy that will carry the message that I am hoping it will carry. I'm sorry to have to confess this in front of people who might have paid attention to my analogies, but then uh, they should, as they should pay attention to yours. But what's going on with those now? How much craft and strategy goes into your presenting analogies where only the biggest idiot would say, let's go with that mainframe. I like that idea. So. Well, I think the economic profession has lost its way, to be honest. I think they're so in love with calculus that they're missing the real world. And I, I sat through so much calculus in my PhD program, I just couldn't take it. And it was, I, the, the, I didn't care what the second derivative of that curve was, the curve is irrelevant. And it was, the, you know, we need to evolve. So one of the best books I read was sort of Good Ideas by Dead Economists. And what it did is it recognized that... Is that a book? Yeah. <laughs> that we're in this evolution of economic thought. And we're in this current sort of calculus fetish of economists. And I don't think it's very helpful. And it's very good for getting publications and journals that no one reads besides you and one other person. But there's some real world problems out here. And so I don't... I've never used calculus. I, I'll, I confess. I do regressions and add and subtract, you know. but that's where the analogies come in, mm -hmm. is that you have to get something that people can grasp onto. Mm -hmm. And I think there's so much math phobia that you know, even if I present a table, people get freaked out. So trying to present it in some other way of communicating. And this is sort of working in, for the Wilderness Society for 17 years of, you know, we're always told, you've got to talk at the sixth grade level to these congressmen. All right, well, let's try some analogies. So that's where it yeah. okay. okay. We kind of uh, didn't do the manipulation and strategic choice of analogies. That, okay. And that might have been a plan to not do that. Okay. Now, the last question, I just think, this is so interesting. The forestry analogy is really, well, not analogy, but taking ideas from forestry and taking it to this. And yet forestry is often seen by some environmental critics as excessively utilitarian, as a kind of degraded, spiritually not um, very appealing mode. And so this notion that, that forestry and that famed utilitarian Gifford Pinchot would seem like our white knight, that's weird, isn't it? I mean, it just seems kind of weird. I, I think where we're at is this is our spotted owl debate. 
right here in the Rockies. We didn't have a big timber war here because we don't grow trees very well here. But this is our spotted owl debate. And if you look where the Pacific Northwest community is now, it's all about collaboration. You know, the collaboration movement came out of button heads over old growth forests. And now you don't have as much disagreement. You have, I felt like this when we had the zero cut movement on national forests. Okay, we can't cut anything. And I'm like, well, actually, I like, like to cut trees and you gotta cut them every once in a while. So you have these extreme movements and you're in the middle and now that's no longer credible and this is, and you have people talking. And I think I'm hoping to really push that dialogue in oil and gas because I don't want to have it take 15 years is what it took forestry to get to the collaborative mode where you can actually get along. I think we can take some of those lessons from forestry and move them up a little bit because this is this is a really important issue and we got to figure it out. And and I think so. What we have the advantage of is foresters and conservationists led the way in the spot owl debate that brings sort of that wisdom now to the oil and gas debate in the Rockies. And that's sort of what we try to do. So uh, I know foresters are very utilitarian and very clear-cut oriented, but they've evolved too. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I hope that, that the same thing can happen. Like when I took civil culture in, in grad school, 15 week semester, one day on uneven age management, then it was back to clear cutting. And now it's about restoration. It's about recreating old growth dynamics. It's about thinning fuel ladders. It's a completely different type of forestry. And, I, I, and I'm hoping that, that we move oil and gas that same direction by applying some of the lessons that we've had in, in the forestry arena. Uh, I think we're, I think we are, although, are we? Um. <laughs> Your show. It is my show. Uh, I think we are going to 8.15, which is a good uh, multiple of five kind of moment. So, okay. So if I could, what is your philosophy on the collaborative mode that we need as a country in the, the economics? So if I could frame it up really quick. Norway as a country, only four million citizens, but they, it's pretty much a whole country at my graduate level research that is like Boulder. But they're the number four oil producer in the world. Every baby that's born has a $100,000 pension that's fully funded from those revenues, so there's a major collaboration going on. Brazil in the 70s developed you know, sugarcane ethanol, which is a lot less corrosive than our corn ethanol. And then you look at Japan getting away from nuclear, and we need to send LNG to that country for it to have you know, sustainable energy in general. And then you look at Russia providing both Poland and Czechoslovakia 100% of the natural gas, and they're pleading with the U.S. to help in case you know they just turn it off. Isn't there a lost opportunity for our country to, to get it right and to, to look at both sides of the political spectrum and shake hands and there's a lot of money to be made? I think so. I. I don't think exporting to Ukraine is going to solve much. I, I just saw an analysis. Eco, Econo Browser just had a great economic analysis saying it's just not enough to make a difference in that. But I, I do think that uh, trying to move it into a more collaborative way. Now, Norway, they got that 100000 for each kid because they have very high royalty rates. That means you're keeping some of the wealth. You have this one-time endowment, and you're just shipping it off and not getting anything. And so you have these other countries that point to examples where you have collaboration because you got a source of money from which then to, you can work on that. And that's why I think updating some of the economic in uh, instruments would provide the money to then you can actually have some collaboration and money to hire people and do the monitoring and address these environmental concerns. I mean, if I'm a community and I don't have baseline data, well, I don't want any drilling because I can't, if I go to court, and the industry says, you don't have baseline data, you lose. Well, I'm going to take my time to get it. So I think having some funding. To, More subsidies or taxation? I wouldn't do the subsidies. I, I'd get rid of all subsidies, actually. That, I mean, I, I know I like people like wind and solar subsidies, subsidies, but More taxation, I'd get rid of all subsidies. I'm, I'm going to make sure that we get this one other person. Yeah, yeah. In, so, no. uh, okay. I'm just curious, what kind of response have you received from the oil and gas industry to your research? <laughs> 
Um, What's your question? Oh, uh, the question was, what response has he received from the oil and gas industry for his research, or from his research? Uh, not very nice comment. <laughs> I have a file this thick. <laughs> I have a file this thick. But you <laughs> haven't received particularly nice comments from the fractivists. No, no, yeah. actually more from the fractivists. Uh, actually, you have nice comments. Yeah. There's a few that, you know, would just want to ban and go back, but no, I, I, I give lots of talk to practice. Hmm. So, no, like, we're, in, we're in good shape. But no, I don't gas. It's just, it's just a mentality, I think. And that's what you have to change with this industry, is this is how it's just been done, because this is how it's just been done. And as we move to more populated areas, it's like, well, I don't think so. And that has to be the change in mentality. And so the whole idea of sort of slowing things down is just sort of, are you kidding me? That's not how you do this thing, because you go in, move your capital, and you move out. And, and that's great for profit maximization, but less so for the community. So I haven't really had much time. I mean, I left the Wilderness Society a couple years ago, and I just work locally, and so I haven't, don't have the, the influence to go and have those conversations. But I know when we first brought this up, uh, there were scathing comments uh, on the idea. Thank you. So are you in the middle if you're not getting equally condemned from? Yeah, I feel pretty good. Do you want to be more condemned for what? I mean, just, we might want to up your condemnation level on the other side. We'll work on that. I can help you with that. So, okay. Well, right. That's I'll be, good I'll plan. be tomorrow. Some hiking too. That would be nice too. So, ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming our speakers. Thank you.